One perhaps unforeseen result of the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor was that it largely unified the country uh, that, as I described to you, for a long time had been divided. Should we participate in the war? Should we help? Or should we remain isolated? Well, the great majority of Americans, it's never unanimous, but the great majority uh, of Americans after the attack at Pearl Harbor was now convinced that the United States needed to join this war. And, in fact, millions of Americans volunteered. Um, there was a, a great sense in the early stages of the war um, of people wanting to participate and wanting to do their part, um, particularly to defeat Japan. And so the uh, Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, in a sense, awakens the sleeping giant of American patriotism and the war machine cranking into effect. And the United States, when it is a unified country, is an awesome sight to behold. Nonetheless, there was also a draft to fill out the, uh, the American army. More than six million people volunteered uh, for the army, but uh, more than 11 million were drafted as well. And so we have a total of about 18 million people who uh, took their physicals for military service. And as you see there, more than a third, more than 6 million uh, were rejected and failed those physicals. And so this is just a final moment that I will remind you about the Great Depression and the creeping effects of the Great Depression. Remember, even during that lecture, I talked about the poor diet and uh, illness that kind of crept in and poor vision, all of these kind of things creeping in after years and years of vitamin deficiency. And we really see it here as World War II is beginning, and it becomes difficult in some ways to fill out the United States Army. So for the first part of this lecture, I want to talk about the home front. We'll talk about a number of different things that were going on uh, on the home front during the war. And certainly the work effort was one of the great and noteworthy things uh, that took place on the home front. While so many of our able-bodied and fittest men were abroad fighting the war, uh, almost everyone else was pitching in on the home front in the work effort, um, particularly in the munitions factories and all of the different areas uh, to supply the war goods. So who was um, participating in this? Well, almost everyone else, um, other than those who had gone to fight in the war. So young men, uh, younger than 18, were working in the factories and doing other things. Uh, farmers coming out of the countryside. In some ways, this is the last major wave of that uh, migration out of the countryside and into the cities. Um, women as well, and we'll talk much more extensively about this in uh, a few moments, um, but you see in the picture here some of the women um, working on the munitions. Uh, African Americans participate in this effort as well, and this is really the final phase of the Great Migration, uh, another wave of blacks leaving the sharecrop farms of the south, what was left of them, uh, and moving up to the north to work in these factories. And as we see, uh, the, the wave of farmers leaving the countryside, and there's something of a void left in those kinds of positions, the United States puts out the call uh, for immigrants to begin coming back into the country, particularly um, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans who come by the millions and begin to fill those positions, most of them um, working on farms in the countryside. So this was a reversal of our policy from the Great Depression years when we actually deported uh, millions of Mexicans because it was such a time of great need. We had no jobs and no ability to care for them. Now, things have completely reversed. Uh, there is more work to be done than we have people to do it. And so we actually put out the call uh, to send um, those immigrants from Mexico and Puerto Rico, and they come by the millions.
It is the incredible productivity of the war years, rather than the New Deal, that brings an end to the Great Depression. One way that we might measure this is simply by the size of the federal budget. Uh, the size of the budget in 1939, at the end of the New Deal, and just as the war is beginning, was about $9 billion. So again, just bear in mind that that is uh, many times over what the federal budget was prior to the Great Depression. In 1945, just a few years later, uh, the federal budget has multiplied about 11-fold to $100 billion. FDR said at one point that he had given up being Dr. New Deal in order to become Dr. Win the War, and so that was really his emphasis. Um, there are other things we can look at in thinking about the production of the war years, the staggering wartime production of uh, war goods and supplies. Over the years of the war, the United States churned out 275,000 airplanes, just a staggering number. Uh, we had produced 88,000 tanks. Um, that's about the number of seats in a large football stadium. Take uh, Death Valley at Clemson or something like that. For every seat in the stadium, we had produced a tank during the war years. We built more than 3,000 ships over the years of the war. And so when we think about the attack at Pearl Harbor and the number of sh ships that had fallen under attack, there were about 30 ships in um, Pearl Harbor at the time of the attack. So by the end of the war, we had replaced Pearl Harbor about a hundredfold. Now, not all of the ships that were built were large um, battleships or destroyers, but many of them were. So how did we pay for all of this? How was the war paid for? Well, certainly uh, income tax paid for some of that productivity, um, and taxes were raised during the war years. And it was a time of, of great economic prosperity, so we could afford that. But the other way that the war was financed, and, and perhaps more memorable than that, was through the sale of war bonds. And perhaps you know what bonds are. Many people uh, are given bonds when they are young or when they're an infant. Uh, grandparents might give them a war bond. And in 20 years or 25 years, uh, they will get that money back with interest. Um, and so war bonds is the same idea. You purchase a war bond, and then in 5 or 10 or 20 years, you will get it back with interest. But we might think about it in a slightly different way. Uh, war bonds, uh, and any kind of bond, but war bonds in particular, are basically a loan to the American government. So uh, the citizen who is buying the war bond is loaning the government that money, and then the government will pay them back after a certain number of years with interest. Um, and so it was through the sale of these war bonds that the country really got through the war. More than $150 billion in war bonds were purchased by Americans. In other words, if we just look at the annual budget of the federal government, uh, a couple of years of the entire budget was paid for by the sale of these war bonds. And there was a huge and aggressive um, publicity campaign to encourage Americans to buy war bonds. You see the poster there at the right is only one example. There are many, many posters like this. Um, back him up, buy war bonds. And there you see the average American citizens, the farmer, the worker, um, supporting the soldier out there in the field by buying these war bonds. Among the other things we can observe about the home front during World War II is that private industry um, almost universally swung around in support of the war effort. That is, um, private industries began uh, assisting the government efforts to produce war goods. And we see things like the Ford Motor Company um, producing Jeeps and tanks and uh, other things that could be made um, to help the war. Um, 
And so on the home front, it became difficult at times to find new um, things to purchase. If we think about the automobile industry again, there were almost no new automobiles um, sold on the home front during 1933 or 1944 because uh, all of the automakers were making goods for the war effort. Uh, it was very difficult to find new clothing during the war years because the clothing manufacturers were making uniforms and socks and hats and uh, helmets and boots and everything else that the soldiers needed. All of these efforts were overseen by uh, a body known as the War Production Board, um, which kept track of how many uh, of all the different supplies were needed, and they instructed the different private industries what they needed to build. Uh, this process didn't always go smoothly. Uh, you can imagine that many private uh, businesses and industries, they are in the business of making money and profiting. And so uh, it wasn't easy at times to ask them to produce war goods. Um, but uh, we certainly got through it. And um, the items that were needed to uh, win the war were ultimately produced. As a related development, um, during the war years, people on the home front were asked to conserve and uh, were required to ration supplies of all kinds of goods that might be needed by the soldiers abroad. Uh, and so each family would receive a coupon book on the home front that would um, allow them to, to purchase however much was in the book as far as um, all manner of different food and supplies. And then uh, you couldn't get any more after that. So you see the coupons there on the right uh, for things like sugar and coffee and flour, um, chocolate and, and meat and all kinds of different goods were um, rationed during the war years. Similarly, people grew victory gardens, um, growing whatever they could um, at home. And there were lots of sayings and phrases associated with this. One of the favorite wartime mottos uh, went, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. And certainly that generation is, uh, is well known for its uh, ability to, um, to make things last. And bear in mind that in many cases this is the Great Depression generation, um, just a few years older. And you see the posters there at the bottom are all um, related to these efforts to ration and to conserve various kinds of supplies. Have you really tried to save gas by getting into a car club? Is your trip necessary? Needless travel interferes with the war effort. And even some kind of unexpected things like the poster there on the left, save waste fats for explosives. Take them to your meat dealer so people would would save their um, kitchen grease and fat and, and bring it to the meat dealer um, to assist with the war effort. Life on the home front for most Americans during the war presented a mix of prosperity and good times with concern about the war, perhaps obsession over the war, and worry about uh, our husbands and sons and fathers, who many of whom were abroad fighting. Uh, entertainment flourished during the war years, and it both reflected uh, the fact that the country was at war and also um, enjoyed a, a sort of boom time as many Americans uh, enjoyed the prosperity, and they also wanted entertainment. They wanted some escape from thinking about the war. Uh, this was in some ways, the heyday of the radio, which is reaching its peak as we are now into the last decade before television uh, is going to be introduced. Um, American families uh, spent much time listening to radio reports of the war, and the broadcaster Edward R. Murrow became famous uh, all around the world for his broadcasts particularly those from London during the air raids, these riveting um, broadcasts of what was going on during the attacks. Uh, Hollywood also enjoyed a sort of boom time during this era. It's, it's the golden age of Hollywood. Uh, and yet it also reflected the fact that the country was at war. As many as half of all the films made during the war years um, 
either directly or indirectly were about um, the war itself. And it also became an important source of news and information as um, people who attended the movies at that time. Uh, you think about going to the movies now and there are a bunch of commercials and a bunch of um, previews of other movies prior to the film beginning. During the war years, uh, prior to the movie beginning, you would see a whole series of newsreels that would either give you information about what was going on in the country or about what was happening in the war itself. And many uh, Hollywood actors also engaged in um, making some of these newsreels and becoming part of the, um, the information machine explaining what was going on during the war. Actually, you see the uh, young lady there at the top right. Uh, she's participating in one of these kinds of films, and that is actually Marilyn Monroe before she became um, known as a, a great movie star of the 1950s. Uh, baseball flourished during this time as well. It is the American game. It is very much a part of the fabric of uh, the country. But it also struggles during the war years. The major leagues are uh, down to some extent because many of the greatest players uh, went to serve in the war. Uh, Hall of Fame players like Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio and Hank Greenberg who served longer than any other um, ball player. Uh, a lot of the best players are gone. And so in their absence, um, the major leagues grew inventive uh, in the effort to fill out their rosters. Um, the the war, war years of World War II saw the oldest player and the youngest player that had ever played up to that point. Uh, and it's also during the war years that a one-armed player named Pete Gray played and a midget uh, short person named Eddie Geidel um, played during the war years. So the major league squads are really struggling to fill out their rosters. Um, and we also see other leagues that drew large audiences during this time. Uh, there was a women's league created. You see the picture down there at the bottom. And perhaps some of you have seen the, the famous and very good film called A League of Their Own about the women's um, baseball league that formed during World War II. And finally, the Negro Leagues are flourishing during this time and um, perhaps reaching their peak as well. Uh, the uh, major leagues are still uh, segregated during this period, and black players not allowed to play in the white major leagues. So they had their own league, and it's only after the war that um, the color line would be broken. You see there at the bottom right, you might recognize a very famous figure of Jackie Robinson. This is when he was playing for the Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro Leagues. And after the war years, of course, it would be Robinson who broke the color line in the Major League.